All right, let's start by um, talking about the uh, interpreting the Fourier series as frequency domain coefficients. Okay, so beginning with continuous time, um, we have, uh, let's assume we have a signal with period T, then we have some coefficients. Fourier series, oh, there we go, gives us some coefficients like this. So these we'll say are the coefficients. And we could think of these, we could interpret them as frequency components. So the frequency associated with them, here it's F. Let's say f negative 2 is just negative 2 over t. And the reason that we make this association is because there's a component of the signal associated with the, we, each of these coefficients. The, uh, and that component is of this form, a, um, the, the component associated with a of negative 2 is this signal here. And a of negative 1 is this one. And so forth. So what it means is if we add all these components together, we get back our original periodic signal. All right. So that's why you see that by substituting in the frequency into the sinusoid where we usually put frequency, we, we see that each coefficient is associated with a certain frequency. And um, that means if we wanted to sort of get a visual understanding of these coefficients, we might plot them on a frequency axis. We might say, here's frequency 0, frequency 1 over t, 2 over t, and what we're plotting here are the coefficients that we get, a0, a1, a2, a negative 1, and so forth. Okay, so this is sort of a, a visualization of these uh, Fourier series coefficients on a frequency plot. Now, should notice that, in fact, um, this is, in fact, a two-dimensional plot. Uh, for example, you might, because the A's are complex, right? So you might do real imaginary, or you might do um, magnitude and phase. Those are a couple of options for how to represent these complex numbers. So in my picture on here, I just am acting like they're real signals, but in fact they're two-dimensional, right? You would need two different plots or a 3D plot in order to represent these in general. Okay. Now for discrete time, again we have a period. We say the period is... Uh, is cap n here. And we noticed something that the AKs are also periodic. That's what we noticed at the end of last lecture. So the quick proof of that is just that AK by formula is the following sum.
And by aliasing, we can, re we can change one part of this formula to an equivalent signal. So this, so let's change that complex exponential to an equivalent one. Equivalent one, it's, we know in discrete time it's equivalent if the frequencies differ by one. So I'm going to change the frequency to be k plus n over n. That differs by one. So if they differ by an integer, they're the same. OK, so this is because of aliasing, that these are, in fact, the same sum, which means that this equals a k plus n by formula, right? OK, so these a's are, in fact, periodic. Um, and hold on. OK, and what that means is that the DFT, which we discussed last time, we know that it returns a vector of a equals, it returns a0, a1, up to a n minus 1. Because that's all you need. You only need one period of these coefficients to get back to your original signal in discrete time. All right. So it just returns this set here. And um, you have this, you, this uh, frequently used FFT shift. We've used this in MATLAB, and all it's doing is the following. It's saying, let's look at these, um, this vector that you're given. You're given a vector a, and it's just a0 up to a n minus 1. And let's look at what's in the middle here. You have a n over 2 minus 1. You have a uh, n over 2. OK, and it just rearranges this vector. Uh, so FFD shift is a very simple function. It just takes the second half of any vector and puts it out in front. Okay. And it's meant to be used after doing a DFT using the FFT command. So what you end up getting is a new vector that goes from A of n over 2 up to A of n minus 1 a0 to a n minus oh, n over 2 minus 1. All right, so you get that. Although we just said that the a's are periodic, so this is equal to a vector of a negative n over 2 up to a negative 1, a0, a n over 2 minus 1. So this is why the FFT shift command makes sense. Because when you rearrange these and consider that it's periodic, now you still get a, a, a new set of coefficients, but it's going from negative to positive. It's symmetric about 0 in frequency. Okay. So in other words, if we were to, again, plot these uh, coefficients, we'd have something of this form. Here's frequency. And you have 0, you have uh, 1 in frequency. And the um, DFT returns you something like this. Uh, let, me, let me draw something nicer. OK. Returns you some, some numbers. I'm just plotting them as a, as a line, a whole bunch of coefficients. They go from frequency 0 to 1, or a little bit less than 1. Why is that? Well, because they actually these coefficients are 0 to n minus 1. But remember, the frequency associated with, with k, with a k, is k over the period. The period is cap n. right? So in other words, these frequencies are going from 0 to n minus 1 over n in frequency, roughly 1. Okay, So if you were to plot what the DFT returned, it returns to coefficients here. However, 
Um, however, we know they're periodic, so we could extend this out and say, oh, well, actually, if, the, if we keep looking at coefficients you know, outside that range, we know what they are because they're periodic. Just take the periodic extension of this, my ugly drawing. Um, and uh, FFT shift just does this. It just says, OK, let's instead shift things around so that we're looking at frequencies uh, negative half to a half. So this is after FFT shift. OK, you're just looking at them centered about 0. Put my note here. This is what the DFT returned. Okay. There's one more thing to note, and that is that for real signals, um, there's actually some redundancy here because for real signals, you, you always have that AK equals A negative K conjugate. We'll revisit this when we look at properties. We'll, we'll see many properties of the Fourier transform over the next week. And this will be one of them. Okay? So if the signal is real in the time domain, then its coefficients are complex conjugates. You have the symmetry. So that means, in fact, that um, so the negative frequencies you can think of as redundant. OK, so that's just a little note. Only true if your signal's real. But many, many times we're interested in real signals, right? It's things like a sound signal. And it's real. And so that means that this picture, I didn't just draw that coincidentally. I made it symmetric on purpose because that's always going to be true for real signals. So in fact, there's no need to plot the negative frequencies under the assumption that your signal's real. They're not going to tell you anything new. Okay. All right, question for you. What's the highest discrete time frequency? OK, we'll get to sample rates in a minute. Let's pretend, let's just say that this discrete time signal it has values only at the integers for now. Then what's the highest frequency? OK, so I'm going to give you, well, does anyone want to throw out something with maybe some justification? And then I will. Uh, I'll give you my answer. Nobody wants to give a number? What? Ah, OK, good. At least you asked the right questions. OK. So um, I'm going to say f equals a half is the highest frequency in discrete time. OK. Why? Well, first of all, let's look at what frequency of a half is, just in terms of cosines, you know, sinusoid. Frequency half means 2 pi half n. Simplify that to cosine of pi n. Let's plot that. Now this is a discrete time signal, but I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit improper, and I'm well, not very straight line. I'm going to um, plot it even between the numbers with values that, of course, are meaningless. Even between the integers, right? Okay. So cosine, of course. It's periodic. It's like this type of thing. And because it's cosine of pi n, it looks like this. All right, there's our cosine. But, the, but in fact, it's a discrete time signal. So it's just that value, that value, that value. There we go. There's cosine of pi n. There's another way to write this. It's negative 1 to the n. These are equal. Now, 
do you believe me that that's the fa fastest frequency you could have in discrete time? I mean, it's changing values, you know, opposite values every single sample. Okay, how could you be a higher frequency than that? You could try to go to put a higher f in to your cosine, but you will see from aliasing that that's going to be the same as a low frequency cosine. All right, they'll be indistinguishable. Okay, so so maybe yes. You're right. Okay, so if we were to sample this, if we're considering that there's some underlying continuous time signal that we're sampling, then certainly that would change the frequencies we can represent. But assuming discrete time is just defined to have a sample at every integer, then one is the fastest frequency. So that's, that's also a great question, because notice, first of all, that um, f equals half, that's exactly this point up in this above plot for the DFT. So I said every DFT, you do an FFT shift, and you're looking at frequencies from negative half to half. And so there's some correspondence there that I'm saying f equals half is the highest frequency. All right. But you, you might say, well, how is that relevant to any sort of signals we care about? You know, we're, we're looking at, let's say, sound or things from the real world. Half is nothing special, right? Um, so how is this related to frequencies of sound? If we could only record sounds up to frequency half, we wouldn't have anything. All right, because we listen to sounds that are hundreds of hertz. Well, the key is it's the units we're talking about. So, um, so here we go. Real life signals like sound. Um, the Notice that the discrete time frequency I'm talking about is cycles per sample, we can call it, per, yeah, per sample. It's a sequence, and we're saying how many cycles per sample. Now, if, as the question that was just asked implies, if this discrete time signal is samples from some continuous time signal, so samples of time, then sample rate, which I'll call F sub S, the sample rate is measured in samples per second. So a discrete time signal technically is just a list of numbers with no context on what these mean in terms of when they were sampled. But if they were sampled in time, then there's some samples per second. And the, of course, you see that by multiplying these two units, you would get cycles per second, which is hertz, which is what we're used to thinking about. So what that means is that um, the frequency domain should actually be scaled. Let's say frequency axis is scaled by the sampling frequency fs. So if you went and modified this plot, and you said, yes, as a discrete time signal, these frequencies are correct. Okay, periodic with period one, about the frequency. Um, but in the context of the sample rate, you would relabel things. And this would become fs. This here uh, would be negative fs, okay, instead of negative one. OK. Let me now move to a little bit of a demo that's sort of uh, going to help us think about things like the Shazam lab, which you'll be doing next week. Maybe before I get into any of this, um, how, many, uh, how many people know what Shazam is? Does anyone have Shazam on their phone to use right now? We can do a little demo. I'll play, I'll play a song, and you can pull it out, and we'll do a live demo of what Shazam does. See what it says. Pink Floyd, all right, good. 
All right, so it, got, it identified the song. So the idea is it, it, it'll record a segment of so song and then tell you what is that from. Uh, you know, what's the name of that song in the album? Okay, so that's what you're going to be doing for the next two weeks in your lab. All right, we're giving you some, some code that uh, will help you along and some explanation of how it works. You're going to use the DFT. In particular, you're going to use the spectrogram, which, is, which you became familiar with in this week's lab and which I will talk more about today. All right, but to begin with, let me just um, do an example of um, looking at a short segment of a song. I'm not going to use that song. I'm going to use Hotel California. I, I, prefer, I like it a little better than that song. But, um, I like both. All right, so um, what I'm going to do here is grab a short segment of you know five or six seconds of a song, and we'll just plot the DFT. This is things you've done in your uh, lab this week already. We'll just do it again right here to see um, what we can say about this. So here, figure one is the, t this is the time domain representation of a short segment, which I'll play to you right now. Okay, so I've just read that in uh, to MATLAB, and I'm plotting the value of you know, the sampled signal. We could, pl we could zoom in and see more interesting uh, features of the waveform if we want. We see some nice periodic looking you know, instrument and voice there. We can actually see something about the beat. These spikes here, you know, there's a drum beat going on, and they're probably at nice even intervals. Okay. Um, now, we can use the DFT to um, look at the frequency content of this whole segment here. Okay, so here's the frequency content. I've plotted, uh, of course, the DFT just gives me back a bunch of numbers. I've put it correctly on this, the frequency scale here. I've used FFT shift to get the negative and positive frequencies. As you see, it's symmetric, so there's not really any need to look at the negative frequencies. In fact, I'm going to look at uh, section... I'm going to look more at the low frequencies because there's, uh, they're a little more interesting. Here you've got, um, let's cut this off at zero better. Okay, so here's zero frequency up to 1.6 kilohertz, something like that. If you're familiar with music, the, the uh, octave that's used in the middle of the piano is down here around 300 to 400. Uh, I guess it's more uh, up to maybe like 600-ish. And you see there's some, some features of this sound where there is more frequency content. Now, one thing, I'm not plotting the DFT entirely because this is a one-dimensional plot, right? I mean, it's two-dimensional, but it's got, the value is only represented as one dimension. What do you think I'm plotting here? The magnitude only, okay? I could plot the phase as well. Turns out you're not going to pull much out of a plot of the phase at this moment, all right? Of course, um, one thing to notice is although we see maybe some notes and you know harmonics that are strong in this segment of sound we don't get any sense by looking at this of when the different sounds happen during that 6 seconds all right we don't we don't we can't see the drum beat here in the time domain plot we might be able to pick out the drum beat and the tempo but in this plot we we'd have a hard time now the information did we lose information when we did this dft okay why Okay, so if we get rid of the phase, as this plot has gotten rid of the phase, then we've lost information. The phase actually is important to tell us when things happen. But uh, if we keep both magnitude and phase, we, we won't have lost any information because we can always get back. We can invert it. So the information may not appear readily there. You know, it may not be easy for us to extract from this what the information is. But it's all there as long as we keep the phase. But but more importantly, we might want to, we want to represent this in a way where you can easily extract the information you're looking for. And we see that we have now two kind of extremes. We've got the time domain representation where we can, look, we can see things about time, but we're not going to easily be able to interpret them in terms of frequency. Okay? We have a frequency representation, but we've kind of lost all, you know, at, at a first glance here, it's not easy to extract anything about the timing. And what we're going to do is go into an in-between um, 
an, uh, an in between these two extremes using the short time Fourier transform. Okay. Um, actually, before I do that, I want to. So I'll explain what the short time Fourier transform is. It's the spectrogram that you've played with already. But before I get there, I want just to think for a moment how you would do Shazam if you didn't know anything about signals. Okay. How would you match two songs? Um, in other words, match two, by match two songs, I mean you have a digital recording, studio recording of the song in your database. And then you have a unknown song that's been recorded on a device somewhere that, that was supposedly a playback of your database song that's been re-recorded, right? And you want to match these and say which one it is. Um, any ideas? I'll throw out some naive ones. If, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Is that what you were going to say? Okay, so you're saying do some sort of dissection where you look at low frequencies, match rhythms, things like that. Let me address, let me uh, talk about this, this idea where you would just match the two signals up and show you why that, which, which is a nice idea, why it won't work very well. Okay, so what I've done is I've actually re recorded um, this. I, I actually played it from my laptop and recorded it on my phone, that exact segment of sound. Let me see where it is. Okay, so it is right here in this other plot. I want to show you how different the same sound is. Maybe first I should play, play it back to you to convince you that this is, in fact, a recording of the same segment of sound. Okay. Okay, so let's play back the original studio recording. I'll play back my recording from my phone. All right, you notice the volume is different. That's not so important. We can adjust the volume. Yes? Okay, there's that too. Yeah, you might not be doing a stereo recording, although you could. Um, we, that, that might be important, but you can get away with, you can design Shazam without even taking into account stereo information. One way to do that is take your two tracks that come from stereo and just add them together, or average them. Okay, so um, you, you hear a difference, but yet this should be possible, right? We should be able to match these songs up, and Shazam does it. I mean, her, her recording was probably very similar when she did Shazam as a, a minute ago. Okay. So now let's look at the time domain plot of these two things. Put them together. Here's the original. Here's the new one. Okay. At first glance, I think it would be very hard to even argue that these are the same thing. They look very different. Yes, if you extracted the beat, which is a nice idea that you were talking about, you would probably find that the beats do match up somehow, although it's hard to even identify the same you know, loud maybe drum beats here down in the plot below, they just kind of hide. They're different. Things are different volume. The reason this happens is because there's a lot of distortion that goes from, re, from, from playing back a sound through the electronic equipment and then re-recording it. And even between the speaker and the microphone, there are, there's echoes, things like that. But just reproducing a sound out of an electronic speaker is not going to make the time domain representation look the same. Surprisingly, it makes the it can make it sound identical to us and yet have a very different time domain representation. Now we can even zoom in here. Maybe these just look different at a large scale. Let's zoom in between 0.5 and 1 and zoom in between 0.5 and 1 here. I mean, even when you zoom in, these look at, look at how nice and structured that is and how chaotic this thing looks. I mean. Maybe it should be surprising that these even sound the same. Yes? Ah, good point. So you're saying, how could we process this and get better information out? We actually can't. That's not the point. So you're right. 
these, these signals, although to the naked eye they look very different, they, have, they actually are very easily matched together. What we're just trying to do is figure out how do you do the matching. And if you did something as simple as take a difference, because that's one thing you might do is try to align these. Take the difference and see if you, you can come up with the best alignment to make that difference small. Then that would absolutely not work. Right? So at least I want to convince you that that idea won't work. But certainly, yes, the information is there somehow. We just need to figure out how to find it. Okay? So that's where this, uh, uh, well, we'll see how in a moment. Let me go back to uh, the notes here. All right. So let's introduce this. Um, let's introduce the short time Fourier transform. And really, the short time Fourier transform is, by Fourier transform, it means a DFT, discrete Fourier transform. OK. So here's a signal represented as a vector. Let's say something OK. There we have a long vector that's a signal. The first thing we do here is divide it into short segments. All right, so we do something like this. All right, divide it up. And for each of these segments, For each of these segments, do a DFT. So DFT there, DFT here. That gives us back something like this. And a different DFT for this part, and so forth. So we do a DFT on each segment. Notice that the DFT has is this is now frequency along here, not time anymore. OK. So that really is the short time Fourier transform. Now you can see that uh, there's, this is easily reversible, right? Because each DFT is invertible. So we can reconstruct each se segment of our sound. We haven't lost anything here. Now the spectrogram is a way of representing this short time Fourier transform. And what you do is you take um, you take these segments oops, and you arrange them into a big matrix. So you put uh, each segment into a column of a matrix. Yeah, we will just plot the magnitude. So right now, think of putting the complex values there, because there's nothing to keep you from doing that. Forming a big matrix, um, like the following. Frequency goes up here. We rotate each of these, have frequency going upward, um, have time going this way. And um, we would do this first column is just this first DFT up here. Okay? And second column is the second DFT segment and so forth. So here's the first DFT, second, third, fourth. Just arrange them, just turn them and arrange them that way. So now we see that lined up here, we have, of course, these all were done on the same uh, width of an interval, so they, the frequencies line up with each other. So across 
the, this matrix, we have a given frequency and we see how its component changes with each new segment. Okay. This gives us a, um, okay, and then what you usually do is you plot only the log magnitude of this. Okay, now, so essentially you throw out the phase. You don't have to throw out the phase, but for the plot at least, and for much many applications, you ignore the phase at this point. It's interesting, and we will talk as the course goes on, what, what the role of phase is in the Fourier transform. Of course, you need the phase to reconstruct. However, you can think of phase as giving you timing information, the shifts of these sinusoids. It also gives you global timing information. When did he say this word in the song? Okay. But once we've divided things up into short times, we already have a lot of timing information. So in fact, throwing out the phase after this process does not lose much for most applications. Okay. Um, so let's go back to our demo here. And what we have is um, I'm now going to plot the spectrogram instead of the time domain representation of both of those signals. Okay, so it's the, the studio recording and our re-recording, which looked so different in the time domain. But yet when you look at the spectrogram, they're very similar. Okay, Yes, there are small differences, but what you see in the spectrogram are little, um, are these peaks that kind of, you see two things going on here. You see these vertical lines. Those are like probably drum beats. They have a lot of frequencies in them. They happen at a very short time duration. But you also see these uh, lines that appear to move and go up and down. And there's sort of many copies that move together. These are from voices, either instrumental or singing, where, um, like in these cases, these are from the singing voice, which has many harmonics. And when he moves his pitch up, all of the harmonics move up together and down together. You can track these to get the pitch. You can get the pitch of the sound by following how these lines move. Okay? You can see that he's saying warm smell of Kalitas. You know, you can, you could, if you know the song well enough, you can figure out what's, what's going on. Um, but more importantly, these are very similar. You could, pa you could match these up because you see the same pattern happen in both. Okay? And in fact, that's what Shazam will do. It's simply what you're going to build is you, you use the short time Fourier transform and you look for features that you can match together. Turns out to be quite easy. You look for um, peak values and where they're placed in time and frequency and see if you can just do a simple pattern match. All right. Now, you're going to start doing the Shazam Lab next week. And um, you're going to do it for two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, I'm going to do a competition that you're not required to participate in. Um, and I'll have a bunch of songs. And you'll use your implementation of Shazam. And we will actually do a. Uh, test where we play it with noise and we and we see if you can your Shazam can still identify it with more noise than other people's uh, implementations okay who can deal who can tolerate the most noise and for the winning group uh, there's uh, two percent of uh, course extra credit points uh, that will be split among your group so if you're a group of two you each get one percent uh, extra credit that's uh, that's one percent applied to the final uh, course grade um, if you're by yourself and you win, then you get 2% yourself. All right. If you have a big group, then you're each going to get a small percent. So you divide up the 2%. So probably groups of two are preferred. Um, yeah, last year we had like five teams participate, but you're all welcome to participate in this. Okay. Um, let's see. One more thing. This music looks, the spectrogram of the music looks kind of chaotic. But I want to show you uh, now a spectrogram of speech, uh, yeah, a segment of speech because it actually looks quite nice. So here's, a, whoops, here's what the sound that I'm going to play to you. I'm going to show you. May we all learn a yellow lion roar. Okay, so that segment, now let me show you what the spectrogram looks like. Quite nice. Um, and this is, this is common to speech. It, it's got very nice structure. You notice two things going on. You notice that you have this ripple pattern going throughout the whole thing. You have these ripples that are there. 
And on top of that, you have like a, um, a larger shape going on. If you ignore the small ripples, you see that there are segments of very, oh, I mean, I guess I didn't explain what these color plots are, but yellow means high values in magnitude. Bluish is low values. So you see these high values kind of constant, that, that move around in some nice, smooth way, okay? These are because of two parts of speech. Uh, you have your pitch, that when you're voicing speech, you talk at a certain pitch. These little ripples are the pitch. And you, if you listen to the recording again, you'd see I raised the pitch a little bit. My pitch moves around. I, I wasn't talking monotone, okay? But you, for speech recognition, you often should just ignore the pitch. What's nice is that this macroscopic uh, information, like if you smoothed out the pitch, okay, and you just looked at where these larger waves are moving, and you track these, these edges, you see that there's some component up here that's kind of a strong component, right? If you ignore the pitch, then, you usually, then that's good for speech recognition. You can follow where these things are, uh, where these larger movements are going, and those are caused by the shape of your mouth and throat, okay? Not so much by the pitch. They're almost pitch invariant, all right? Which is why you can use them to do speech recognition and speaker recognition. So you sort of separate out these two parts. Okay. All right, now I want to introduce the Fourier transform. So far, we've talked about the Fourier series, and um, we haven't actually defined this Fourier transform. So, so far, we have, um, let's see, continuous time Fourier series. and discrete time Fourier series. And we've, in the last couple of lectures, we've discussed this DFT, and now, just now, the spectrogram. But we know that the DFT is really just equivalent to the discrete time Fourier series. And the spectrogram is just constructed from DFT. So really, we haven't done anything beyond the Fourier series. We've done continuous time Fourier series and discrete time Fourier series. Let me mention, what is the assumption for the Fourier series? It's that both of these, it's, for both of them, it's that your signal is periodic. Okay, and we want to remove that assumption. All right. Now, one important thing. The Fourier series we associate with periodic signals. The DFT from your experience so far, you probably do not associate with periodic signals. You think of some segment of sound that's finite in duration, right? So how are these equivalent? Well, as we mentioned, they're equivalent because a finite duration signal can be, you can repeat it and conceptually think of any finite duration signal by its periodic extension as being a periodic signal. Now, why would you do that? I have some segment of sound. It's clearly not periodic. Why should I think of it as a periodic signal? The reason you should, you should occasionally think of it that way is because, precisely because the DFT and the Fourier series are the same. And so um, when you're doing a DFT on a signal of finite duration, sometimes to understand what's going on in your DFT, it's smart to remember that you should think of this as a periodic signal, that this is just the Fourier series of its periodic extension. Think back to what you did in your lab this week when you had a sinusoid that nicely matched the length of the window of, you know, uh, the, the length of the vector that you created. You took the, the DFT, all right, and you got a nice one single component in your DFT. Was this part of this lab? Okay. And, uh, and then when you made the vector length slightly off from the period of the sign, you didn't get one component. You didn't even get just the two neighbors, which maybe you would have expected. You get a bunch of other things nearby. And you try to understand why is this happening. But if you equate DFT to the Fourier series, and you say, this is a Fourier series of the periodic extension of this signal. If you do a periodic extension of that vector that you created, you see that only if the period lines up do you get a nice sinusoid. If the period doesn't line up, and you look at the periodic extension, you get, some, you get something going on at the edge. Okay? And that something going on at the edge is a good explanation for why the DFT doesn't just tell you there's one sinusoid there. Okay? Because it, it has to construct the sinusoids that, that give you that anomaly at the edge. All right. Okay. 
So for the Fourier series, what we have is the following. So for the Fourier transform, let's motivate it by saying um, the getting it from the Fourier series. Oops, Fourier. So suppose you have some signal that actually only lives in some finite duration from 0 to t1. This signal, it, it's actually defined for all t, but it's just 0 everywhere else. Okay. Now, this is not a periodic signal. So how can we do anything Fourier to this signal? What can we do? Well, let's try to use the series somehow. All right. So what if we calculated Fourier series coefficients using the formula for just that window. So let's say we, we, we take our 0 to t1, and we, we just look at, this, uh, at that window. We ignore everything else. And we calculate some coefficients. ak equals 1 over t1, sum x, whoops, x of t, e to the negative i, 2 pi, k over t1, T. Uh, no, I'm mixing sums and integrals. Uh, yeah. Let's do that. Integral, 0 to t1. OK, so we could do this calculation. We could get some coefficients. But these coefficients are coefficients that would reproduce the periodic extension of this, not this signal itself. right? So those coefficients, if you inverted them, you'd get some periodic thing like this. right? All right, fine. At least it would match your signal during that interval 0 to t1. And then it would be different outside of that interval. OK, fine. But what if we do something like that, but we calculate the Fourier series on a larger interval? So here's t1. And let's say you have some t2. And that t2, again, we, we have our signal here. Whoops. And, um, but we calculate the Fourier series with respect to this larger interval, t2. So now we do ak equals 1 over t2, integral from 0 to t2, of the same thing. Oops, that's a t. OK. Now, of course, just like before, the, these coefficients would be associated with a periodic extension of this signal when you when you do the inverse. But now the periods are going to be spread out, right? So it's going to be some signal like this, right? Periodic with period 2t, t2. T. T2. OK, the point is, what if we let t go to infinity? t2 go to infinity. Well, then, you know, we're going to end up faithfully reproducing our signal with the zeros, all right, up to some very large point when it would finally repeat, all right? And we're going to let this t2 go to infinity. And that's going to give us the Fourier transform. So um, I want, yep, to have a couple minutes. So let's um, notice something here to get the Fourier transform formula. Oops. That the coefficients you got from this first case were at frequency 0, 1 over t1, 1 over t2 t2, and so forth, and we got some, some coefficients. When we did the second attempt to use the Fourier series, we got coefficients that were closer in frequency, because they were 1 over t2, 2 over t2, and so forth. If you take a good look at, and we got a new set of coefficients, right? If you take a good look at how you calculate those coefficients, you'll find this equation for the Fourier series, uh, the Fourier transform, which doesn't assume periodicity. And that is, let's say, in continuous time, let's use a capital X as a function of frequency. This is no longer a sequence of numbers. This is now a, a function for any frequency. Define that to be the integral from negative infinity to infinity, x of t, 
e to the negative i 2 pi. And instead of putting k over t, these discrete frequencies, we'll just put f t dt. So this function, if you notice, these, these uh, calculations up here, oops, these calculations up here for these coefficients can be expressed in terms of this function. They're just this function evaluated at various frequencies. So you can think of this function as being an underlying, uh, underlying all of these samples in both of these cases. And you're just sampling that function x of f at the frequencies of interest to do these Fourier series. Okay? So this x of f is actually a function that tells you about all the frequencies. And uh, we have a way of inverting it. I'll just write the inverse. That'll be the last time we, thing we do here. The inverse says that the, um, that to go back to x of t, you, rather than summing series coefficients, you now integrate. And you can see why from, from these approximations. Maybe I'll discuss that a little more next time. You just integrate this function times e to the i 2 pi f t df. Okay, so looks almost the same as the forward Fourier transform. Okay, so here's continuous time. We'll, we'll revisit this next time.